Hello. How are you doing today? <laughs> doing okay. I know we had some little problems, but we're doing okay. Um, you know, I just read your file and I'm very excited. Uh, I actually heard, I uh, growing up, I heard about Car 54, Where Are You? And I saw, saw that you did some amazing movies like Death Wish. Um, you did the voice of Gar, you know, you were in the voice of Garfield and G.I. Joe. Uh, so can you tell me about a little bit about yourself? Okay, <laughs> number one, I lived on the streets in Harlem. I'm from Harlem in New York. I don't know if you know Harlem at all. I've heard of it, never been to New York. <laughs> okay, uh, I was born to immigrant parents. Uh, in fact, my father was here illegally I was born very late, late in life to them. My mother was in her late forties and my father was in his late fifties and I was an unexpected joy. <laughs> so um, I have two half brothers that were both in the military when I was born. My birth certificate showed four last names. Wow. Exactly. And so I never knew who I was. Uh, when I was very young, uh, my mother and father were fruit and vegetable peddlers with a push cart. And they worked 15, 16 hours a day. Now, both my older brothers, my half brothers were in the military. There was no one to look after me. And so I lived on the streets. My friend, myself and a friend of mine named George Washington Jr., we slept in cardboard boxes and we lived on whatever food we could scrounge. The only time we uh, had something definite is when we would steal a couple of potatoes and throw them in a huge fire in a trash can. Wow. Uh, I was always in trouble. A gentleman who was the mayor of Harlem uh, was my mother's customer. And my mother was telling him that I was always in trouble. I was always either fighting or doing something to get me in, in, in deep with other rather unsavory people. And so the mayor of Harlem came to me and said, uh, Oh, am I interfering? You're look. You're reading. Oh no, no, no! I'm recording you at the same time. So for some reason, my Facebook is not. I, you know, it's acting up for some reason. I was trying to do Facebook Live. It is not act. It's just being stupid right now. <laughs> so sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Can you see me? Because I can't see myself. I can't see you. Did you can't. You put the camera off. Yeah. Nope. There you <laughs> yeah. go. There you go. I see you now. Oh, okay. <laughs> I it, it, it's new technology. It's always fun, you know. So I was trying <laughs> to face, I was trying to Facebook Live it, but for some reason it's not letting me do it for some strange, awkward. Crazy, but that's okay. My my guests don't. I'll I'll put it on YouTube. So go ahead with your story. <laughs> anyway, uh, the mayor Harlem took me to meet Sammy Davis Jr. I didn't know I was going to to the Apollo Theater, which was uh, an all African American theater. I thought he went to me to see. Sammy Davis Jr. perform. No, he brought me right to his dressing room. And I was 12 years old at the time. Went in his dressing room and Sammy said, uh, sit down. I did, I sat there. And he said, I understand you, you're a pretty tough kid. 
He asked, uh, yeah, I'm tough, which was true. I became, I started martial arts when I was 11 for the wrong reasons. I wanted to be a better street fighter. But my teacher said that you will not come here. This is not <laughs> for learning to be a street fighter. And he was right because after a while, I learned respect and humility, something that I did not have any idea of what those, those two words were. Well, Sammy Davis Jr. said, well, you're tough. He said, tough guys wind up with, the, with broken bones and scars. He said, but you're far beyond that. He said, the way you're going, you're gonna to go to prison or you're gonna die. I was 12 but I had a gun in my pocket. Oh, wow. 12 years old with a pistol. And as he was speaking, the gun started getting heavier and heavier and heavier in my pocket. Well, Sammy Davis Jr. got me a job with an all African-American band. I was a band boy. I said, what, what is band boy? He said, you put the music out for the different musicians. And at the end of the evening or the end of the gig, you collect all of those charts, put them in proper books and put them away. Well, I did. And at the end of the evening, the band leader who was named Lucky Millinder came to me and said, did a good job, man. And he handed me $50, nice. $50. And I, I looked at him, he said, get yourself some new kicks, shoes. Because my shoes were torn in shreds. In fact, my left shoe, the sole was held on a big rub, with a big rubber band. So I went to Florsheim Shoes the next day and I bought a pair of shoes for $15. And Florsheim is very, very expensive shoe. And I gave the 35 to my mother more money than she had seen ever. Well, Sammy also got me, he made a couple phone calls and he got me a job in the Catskills because I had a reputation aside from being a tough guy, but very funny. I got out of a lot of problems by making jokes about the neighborhood and the clothes that we wore. And I watched the top comedians and learned. I wrote, I started writing material. In fact, at one time I wrote a joke that was sold to the Eddie Cantor show. And they sent me a check for $25. Wow. And I went, whoa. <laughs> well, 20 some odd years later, I'm Tony Bennett's opening act. I was with Tony for four years. I and mean, here we are at the Sands. I'm performing at the Sands in Las Vegas. Ringside, <clears throat> excuse me, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Peter Lawford, and Sammy Davis Jr. After the show, <clears throat> excuse me. Everyone came backstage to see Tony, except for Sam. He came up to me <coughs> and said, uh, you look so familiar. You're a funny cat. Well, where do I know you from? I said, Sam, I'm the kid you said was going to go to prison or die. He said, that's you? I said, yeah. We hugged and we cried, the two of us standing there sobbing. Sammy Davis Jr. became my angel. In fact, I go to prisons because of the Anna Marie. He set it up that I go to prisons and I talk to children, kids that are incarcerated. And I don't talk down to them 
All I do is tell them I was there. Where you are seated now, I was there. And prior to talking to them, Deanna Marie runs a film of me on Car 54, where are you? And I was one of the stars of the show. And I've got these kids looking and thinking. And I said, God sent me an angel, an angel by the name of Sammy Davis Jr. Now, you, you, there are angels waiting for you, every one of you. But you gotta listen. You gotta listen with your ears and your heart. I got 14 letters from these kids. And each letter said, Mr. Mr. Garrett, Sammy Davis Jr. was your angel, you're our angel. And I can't be begin to tell you how that had, had affected me. Seeing these kids, in fact, anything I sell, my book, I have a book out, just came out. And just wanna, if you can see that. Mm -hmm. It's about my life and the successes I've achieved, not always, but the proceeds go to the disabled American veterans, wounded warriors, and now we're establishing a thing called Hangsters kids. We want to give kids a place to go to, get off the street. Even if it's just for a few hours after school, even if you're not in school, come, come here. We're going to have games. We'll have television you can sit and watch. We're going to have people you can talk to. And if you're hungry, we'll have food for you. So that's what we're shooting for. And would, you, would it be ready in 2021 since of COVID-19 right now because of the, the pandemic, you know, slowing down? Or... Well, we, we, we even we haven't even started because there's been so much happening with the book. Uh, in fact, my publicist, uh, and Holland Bowl, I don't know if you know Holland. I know him pretty well. He's, he's a big help, yes. <laughs> he's worked with the biggest stars in show business. And I'm flattered that he's representing me. So he, oh boy, Holland, he's always talking about giving back. And that's what we're trying to do, give back. There are so many in need. Oh my God, all these kids that are in trouble carrying guns. And I know because I was there. I, I became a cop, a New York cop, uh, because I thought I could make a difference. And I realized I couldn't, I couldn't, I was fighting the street and I was fighting the other people who are putting kids off the street into prison. Well, one day uh, a friend of mine got me an audition and I was I met a gentleman named Matt Hyken. He had created Bill Go Show and so many shows before your time. <laughs> And he was working on a show called Car 54, Where Are You? Which was a comedy about the police department. And when I sat next, next to him, I sat opposite Nat, and he said to me, you're Ed Nicholson. And I said, oh, no, 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 I'm Hank Garrett. He said, just the kind of dummy I'm looking for. Nicholson is the character you're going to play on Car 54. The show became a huge hit, and I became a, a star 
because of the show. And that was the beginning for me uh, because I st started to get recognition because of the car fit before. I was doing guest appearances and movies all over. Uh, I won a claim for Serpico with Al Pacino. And then I was cast in this movie, Three Days of the Condor with Robert Redford. Yep, I remember that movie. <laughs> Did you see it? Well, I, I heard of it. I'm 44, oh. I haven't seen it. So I've heard of most of the films that you've been in. I've been reading your bio and I've told my mom and dad I've seen it. So it's like, and I've seen that you were in Death Wish and then I've seen that you were you did the voiceover for Garfield, and for, you know, Garfield, G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe, I, I watched as a kid growing up because I was in the 70s, uh, born 1976. So yeah, a lot of people don't know it. And then I was telling my mom who you are. She goes, you mean the baseball ballet player? I said, no, Hey Garrett. He was on, he's an actor who did Car 54. Where are you? At the time she was in London. So she's going to get to see your, your show. So this was a long time ago, but it first started out in the United States. Oh, uh, I did a show in London. I was, uh, I was there for a year and a half doing that was the week that was it was a very popular show oh, okay and I, I i got it uh i did dialectic gibberish the, the star of the show would interview me and one time i was an italian count it's it sounds like it's italian but it's just gibberish and then he would he would translate. So I did a different character each week. And I learned to do that from Sid Caesar. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant comedian, had different television shows all the time. So uh, I was, you know, I've been very fortunate, truly fortunate to be given the opportunity to do all the things that I did do, I was also uh, a professional wrestler. And I'm in the Hall of Fame, the, pre the Wrestling Hall of Fame. Are you the, uh, it's not WWE, is it? I was with the, w the WWO, World Wrestling Organization. And uh, I'm also a martial artist. And I'm a grand master in martial arts. I'm in the Karate Hall of Fame. So now <laughs> that's enough about me. What about you? Well, I I started doing the podcast about nine years ago, and why I wanted to do the podcast is to get the uh, word out that about a syndrome that I got diagnosed at twenty. Uh, at 30 years old, it's called 22Q11. It's uh, it's a, uh, it's like Down syndrome. So you get similar features with Down syndrome with 22Q. And I got diagnosed at an early age, so I wanted to get people more aware of it and talk about it and bring awareness to the podcast. So in my time of doing the podcast, I didn't. I had dead air in the beginning because I had no content. I had nothing. Um, I didn't know what I was going to talk to about. So my dad would be texting me and say, talk, say something, you know, and I would not say anything because I had nothing to say. So then I met Harlan and Harlan's been giving me all the celebrities like Hanson Williams, you, Jerry Jewell, uh, Allison from Little House on the Prairie. And so it because all the celebrities have different causes and events that want to come to the show. We also talk about disability rights. We talk about disability advocacy. And so we want to make sure people know more on what's going on in the world and that celebrities have causes that they want to bring to the show and, you know, like what they want to do, how they want to promote it what kind of awareness they want to bring. So that's basically what the awareness is about. It's about different causes and events 
and, and talk about rare diseases for the show. So we try to make it fun. And oh, Thursday we're having a, a Christmas show a party on podcast. And so, you know, we have all forms of uh, celebrities uh, in the past. I've had Bobby Collins. He's a famous comedian. He comes on to the show. I've had uh, uh, pro wrestlers on the show. I've had WWE superstars on the show. <laughs> so it, it, it just grew, and we were doing it for nine years. And so basically the show is about, like I said, cause and rare diseases. And events, and we have a lot of fun on the show. And we talk about topics like COVID 19, we talk about disability rights, what's coming up, you know, what, what resources are available to people who have special needs. And we try to get those resources available to them as well. That's wonderful. So I always ask my guests this I have a lot of uh, friends who want to ask or want to get into the business and they always look for internships and they don't know how to get into the business so I always ask what 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 would you tell them how how would you get the foot in the door per se well number one uh, I tell everyone who talks about show business give it a shot because there are so many people who have a lot of talent who never thought they did have enough talent to become a performer. And I tell them, you'll know soon enough, but you've got to give it a try. If not, you're gonna all your life say, why didn't I at least try? Years ago, there was a young man who was a messenger and he, we ran into him, this was in New York. He came up to me and said, I've seen you in so many different things. I said, yeah. He said, God, I wanna be an actor. I said, well, have you studied at all? Or have you been in any plays, even if school plays? He said, uh, I'm a good martial artist. No, he, reach me where I live. And I said, oh, and I took him to lunch. And I said, how have you been trying? He said, I don't know where to go. And at the time there was a newspaper. Uh, it was a, actually a, a magazine called Casting News. And I said, get a copy of Casting News. You can get it on a newsstand and go through each category that you think you fit. And he did. Several months later, I'm doing a movie and he's an extra on the movie. And he waved to me and I said, oh, how you doing? He said, good. He said, I got cast on this. I went to a place that uses extras. And I said, it's a great start, but don't get trapped into doing nothing but extras. And that happens to a lot of people who don't think they have the talent to do anything else. It's a good way to pick up some money. You're never gonna get rich being an extra. I said, and audition, go up for things, even if it's a little bit of a stretch Show them your personality, something that you can add to the character they're looking for. And I taught them, and it's what I was teaching a little bit. And I said, you give life to the character. It's not something you say, okay, I'm gonna play a detective. Uh, so I'll have a gun and a badge. And I, and I said, and what? happened before for this, before he became a detective. What ha where did he get the idea to become a detective? What kind of a detective is he? Is he a guy with good heart or is this an opportunity for him to be mean to people? Of course, he's got the gun and the badge. So 
I had him write a bio about the, any character that he want, thought he could play. Well, he did. And I, I guess maybe a year or two later, I'm watching a movie on television and he's in it. And he's playing a martial artist who is a mess, not a messenger, but works for a bank. And the bank is being held up and he becomes the hero by defeating the Hank, the guy is trying to rob the bank. And he did, he was wonderful. So I was very proud to be part of that. And that's what I do when I teach. First of all, you've got to really want it. Not say, oh boy, if that, would that be lovely and I had have a big car and uh, just, you know, let's go there little by little. And uh, I believe, and honestly, believing is so important. Yeah. Believe you can do it. Don't let anybody shoot you down. And uh, in fact, one of the characters that I play on G.I. Joe character named Dial Tone. I remember him. <laughs> In fact, I, I have all the Dial Tone pictures that I was selling at autograph shows. And all the proceeds would go to the disabled vets. And it's so funny, there just a few days ago, all the people who were on G.I. Joe were now going to be, we're going to be represented uh, and people are going to want our autographs, which will be for sale. And you can actually talk to the character. Phone, Zoom, or on the phone, and they, they will pay a, a slight charge, whatever it is. I haven't even been told that. But you can talk to Dial Tone. <laughs> and I also was Fluffy and Fast Eddie on Garfield. So, yeah. so that's who I am. <laughs> now, do you have, do you keep all, do you get any of the action figures from G.I. Joe or Garfield? Did they, you know? Yeah, I have, I have a couple of the figures uh, that when I do a G.I. Joe uh, get together, I, I have the figures. In fact, I have uh, one of the Jeeps. It's still in package. <laughs> So I don't know if you know, now they have Funko Pops that they're making G.I. Joe's and the Funko Pops, they look, they look like this. So I'll give you a little heads up. That's a Funko Pop. So, uh -huh. so uh, they, they have G.I. Joe now in this style too. So it's interesting because you see all these childhood memorabilia, you know, Oh, I remember G.I. Joe. I remember this. I remember that. And then I get excited because, oh, I see this is part of my childhood. So I'm getting excited. And then when I talk to people, they don't, they go, how do you get guests like, hey, Garrett, how do you get guests like Gary Jewel from the Fast Life? You know, Allison uh, from the Little House of Ontario. And I said, I have a special, I have a very good friend, Harlan Ball. He always contacts me and says, hey, this would be a good fit for your show. Come on to the show. You know, she's really good. Um, like I said, I do have, a, I have a special needs myself. And so I just, like I said, it's all about having fun on the award show. And we just try to make it like warm and fun loving for you guys. And talking about old memories, a lot of listeners don't know who you are. But once I show them a picture of you guys, they'll be like, oh. Oh, that's him! I remember him. So I got a lot of friends who are, who like '80s who are like GI Joe, and when I show them the picture of you on Facebook with GI Joe, they'll be like, oh, "That's him! I know him!" So <laughs> they get a little excited, and they don't know how I get all these guests on the show. My mom doesn't even know half of the time I get these guests on the show, so she's excited, and it's like. I want to keep going at it and make it a go at it. So 
hopefully maybe keeping it up for 20 years. I don't know. I'm numb, I'm numb and scully. I know that for sure. So, um, so we just like basically have fun on the awarded show. And my last question for you, Hank, do you have any social media? How can they find you on social media if they want to reach out to you? Uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. What's your name? I, with my name, Hank. Hank. And okay. No, Daniel <laughs> said that I wrestled on the Hank Garrett. <laughs> now, do you have the YouTube channel as well, Hank Garrett? Uh, Deanna Marie, who's my manager, and I. Do you have what? YouTube channel. No, not yet. But uh, once we form Hangsters Kids, we should get that, huh? We should. Yeah. Uh, so we'll contact you, Michelle, to find out how. Hey, I'll help you. You're happy to do that. i be uh, right now. I'm working with the state on putting some social media video together for them. So I'll be happy to help you guys out. Oh, wonderful. So because especially with the book that's got out, we're gonna we're gonna need as much help as we can get. The book I'll has be happy to help you. Oh, fantastic. So when yep. Christmas was two weeks away, we have two weeks away for Christmas. Are you guys planning to stay stay at home for Christmas because of COVID? Or are you gonna go out with your family or well what we what i have been doing uh a friend of mine in florida i sent her a book she got so excited she ordered 35 that she's using as christmas presents so autographed and we were flattered and several other friends have been buying books from me because I can autograph them. If they want, they can find the book on uh, Amazon. Amazon and, uh, but it's not autographed. If they, they get in touch with me and uh, I would designate and autograph. And the website too. I'm sorry. The website too. And the website. Our website. It's hankgarrett.biz. Cool. And what I could do is I could post that on my social media page and let people know that you have a book out so they could buy your book. And the the book, uh, people got so excited about it. Uh, and they said, this has got to be a movie because it does read like a movie, you know, going from the streets, the slums. I live in a, okay. Fifth floor walk up slum, to give you an idea. If you walked into the kitchen at night and you put on the light and the light was a drawstring hanging right. from the lamp and the wall was covered in roaches. Mm -hmm. I mean, completely covered. As soon as the light came on, they started running. One evening, I was still quite young. I was lying in bed and I felt weight, heaviness on my chest. I put the light on and it was a huge rat sitting on oh, my wow. chest. I lived with so much death. We were a bunch of kids. We were just coming home from school. We had turned the corner onto my block. And one of the kids with us fell. And we laughed, thinking he was so clumsy and yet he tripped. When we looked down, we saw blood pouring out of his head. Somebody had shot him from a roof. Somebody with a rifle fired into the crowd and killed my friend. Oh, wow. And I've seen truly as a kid, so much death, so much anger that I thought that was part of life. When I, when I left the block, a man who was 
te Hebrew teacher. He took me because I was always fighting. I didn't know what my hands were for. I didn't know you use it to eat or not even just to punches. He invited me to dinner. He was going to take me to a restaurant. I'd never been in a restaurant. And I sat there and I saw all these implements in front of me. Two forks, two knives. All I knew was one fork and you jammed your food and held it up to your mouth and took a bite out of whatever. If it could be a steak, you held a whole steak on that fork and you bit into it. It was animalistic, but that was the kind of life I had. In fact, he was so cool. Every time he was going to eat, he would pick up the knife and the fork, not to demonstrate, but he, that's exactly what he was doing, but he held them just like, a, he, for a moment, he showed me what they were. And then he put jab into the fork and watch me do the same. I was copying all his moves. And that's how I learned to eat. Like I was in a restaurant, not in a cave. That's what I kind of lived in a cave. One, one evening, I also slept under the stairwell of the building. I was going to go to sleep and there was somebody under that stairwell. And they said, hey, man, get up. That's my place. And he didn't move. And I kicked his foot to see if he would react. And he didn't. He was dead. I'm a kid. And I'm seeing a, an adult dead. Well, I went and got the janitor of the building. He lived on the ground floor. I knocked on his door and I said, there's somebody. They called the cops. They scooped him up and that was it. He died of an overdose on drugs. Oh, wow. But I saw people being stabbed to death. I saw people being shot to death. Stuff that I saw as a kid. And so when I went to an area, I it's called casing. I checked everything out, every corner of where I was. That's called casing, casing your, the joint. And it took a long time for me not to sit somewhere, and I still do it, like just checking my whereabouts because that was the kind of life I, exposed, I was exposed to. But uh, things have changed. Yes. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, they have. So uh, Chris is, like I said, two weeks away. Are you planning to stay home for the holidays? Or are you going to go and to your friend's house or to your family? I don't know. Uh, do we go in a crowd? We don't know. Do we stay by ourselves? We feel a lot safer that way. Right. But we also miss out on a lot that's going on. Yeah. A friend of mine had a big Thanksgiving, he had a Thanksgiving fest at his place. And he said, oh, you missed a great time. But we heard there was gonna be over 20 people in this one room. We thought like, better. Nope, that's it. <laughs> Bye, have fun. Yeah, it's basically how my mom and dad like. We are both, all of us are at high risk, and we we don't want to go anywhere until you know we get the shots for the COVID, and then we go see our friends and family. And I've had a couple of friends that had the COVID test, and I'm like, I'm not. I love you guys, but I don't want to get sick. I can't risk my parents getting sick because they're in their sixties. And they have diabetes and they're at high risk. And so 
we just basically stayed inside, you know, try not to get a, anybody's nerves, but that's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, um, so, so tired yeah. of the mask. Yeah. And they gave me, I went to the doctor's today and they gave me a kid's mask because my face is so small. And when I put on the adult mask, it keeps falling off my face. So I had to wear a kid's mask. And so, you know, I don't mind wearing the mask, but not all the time. And I've been, uh, I've been having problems breathing. So, and you know, we have a lot of Santa Ana winds in, in Southern California. So people with allergies, they get, you know, hit hard with this COVID-19. So when you're sneezing and you're coughing, people think, oh, you got COVID-19. And you say, no, you got oh. sinus, you know? And they're like, no, you don't. You got, you know, you have COVID. Stay away from me. I go, you can't get sick with your allergies acting up. So <laughs> it it's a crazy world and it's a crazy time. Yes, it's and it's scary. Oh, it is. God. Well, thank you, Hank. I love interviewing you. I will send a copy to you and your to your public uh, to the publicist, and I'll be uh, posting posting this up on the YouTube channel. So, uh, I'll you. edit it in a few minutes. And I want to wish you a happy holidays and a happy new year. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. Need, and if you ever need any help, let me know. I'm always here to help you out. Oh, that would be wonderful. Thank you so very much. Yes. And the most miss? important, stay well and God bless. Yes. Love you guys. This is the, the host, yes. Michelle Pierre and the Water Show. And hey, thank you very much. I love you. And <laughs> I will post this up as soon as I can. Thank Bye. you. Stay well. You too.